morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars on a, you know, it's an averagely cool Florida morning. For winter, it kind of sucks. Uh, frankly, I'd been getting used to better weather. The mornings had been kind of nippy. We'd even had some freezing days. It's just been absolutely lovely. And uh, then, you know, about a week ago, things kind of returned to normal. We're getting hot in the middle of the day. It's a little bit sweaty, muggy, and tropical if you're outside, and really only the mornings and the evenings are good. So uh, it's probably the waning days of season. I keep hoping there's going to be a few more cold spells, but there probably won't be, and, uh, and there it is. I know I haven't done a video in a fairly good amount of time, and I apologize for that. I mean, it's been like three or four weeks, and, you know, there's a variety of reasons for it. It's like death by a thousand cuts, but... Uh, Long story short, they didn't get done. It started, you know, I was getting stuff ready for Mecham uh, in Kissimmee. Uh, I went there. I stayed at a very strange Airbnb that seemed to specialize in indoor topiary. And uh, even though the place was kind of cheap, the you know, like the curtains in the bedroom I was in looked like something from Versailles. And there were, you know, little hidden busts here and there and all kinds of weird decor. Uh, so it was a strange place. But frankly, I wasn't there for that. We, you know, left there to go to Mecham, which was great fun. Uh, I'll overlay a few pictures. I'd never seen so many winged Mopars in one place in my life. Uh, it was uh, absolutely strange. Uh, but, uh, you know, I had mixed results. I brought about five cars there. Three of them sold. Two of them did well. Uh, the other two didn't do shit, and uh, here I am back at it. So, I, you know, I came back from there. I took another little trip somewhere to meet someone that didn't work out well, of course. And uh, then I've just spent, like, the last three weeks being annoyed and disappointed by the people in my life, which is just typical, you know, it's just what happens. And uh, the videos weren't forthcoming. I bought a few at Mecham. I'm getting them ready. They're fighting me every step of the way as cars are want to do and uh, you know as soon as they're up I'll, I'll get them up. I bought that little Renault Alliance. I swear that's coming but uh, you wouldn't believe what a little pain in the ass that car has been. I've had girlfriends that aren't as annoying as that car. <sighs> Leave it to the French but we'll get there. Uh, what else can I tell you about before we get into it? You know, I meant to do the motorhome thing. We had talked about that. I had the motorhome out. I'm ready for a trip. A friend of mine came and said, look, man, I just, I bought these buildings. We got to start a shop there. We got to do something. So I did. I went over there and I started a shop with a friend of mine and, uh, you know, things just don't always work out like you plan. So I've hired Dalton, which honestly is like shoving a pine cone up my rear end. And he's there. And, you know, we're doing stuff. And all I want to do is get in that old shitty Ford motorhome, which is now running, by the way. Uh, thanks to my good friend uh, Dalvaro, the Puerto Rican mechanic. The transsexual mechanic didn't help with that. Uh, but she did get an IROC running for me lately, which was good. Uh, actually, not an IROC, sorry, a Trans Am. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. And uh, we're going to get into this. So what I have today is a 1961 Ford Fairlane 500 Club Sedan. Uh, this is a Penelope car, you know, one of my great benefactors, Penelope. This I, I found it. It was, you know, through a friend of mine. I say, hey, I bought a collection. I ended up with this thing. Do you want it? And uh, I thought, yeah, man, yeah, I do. But uh, I'm a little bit cash poor at the moment from, you know, not selling enough over at the Meekum thing. So I called up Penelope and said, man, you should buy this thing. Uh, she did. And here we are now. And it's just an absolutely fascinating car to me. And uh, we'll get in to why uh, as we go. In fact, the video could have taken a few different directions. I mean, the Ford Fairlane as a model, I could have done that. Uh, in fact, there was that movie with Andrew Dice Clay, The Adventures of Ford Fairlane, and honestly, that's what soured me on that whole idea. Uh, the street sleeper thing, but I think we did that before. I don't remember which car it was, but I remember talking about street sleepers, so that kind of went by the wayside. And then finally... The trunk of this car and the theme of this car gave me the plan to go with a moonshining setup, uh, which we'll get into more correctly, bootlegging. And uh, I think that's what this car was themed as, you know, even if it's not entirely. You know, a true moonshining bootlegging car is probably going to be 
20, 30 years older than this one, but uh, it'll do. It'll get the job done. Moonshining seemed like a fun thing to talk about, and uh, that's what they're going to, you know, that's what we're going to do. Whether anyone likes it or not, that's what I find interesting about this. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, so only very briefly, the Ford Fairlane. Uh, it was a model that was sold between 55 and 1970 by Ford, obviously. Uh, and the name itself came from the Dearborn estate of Henry Ford. I guess that was called Fairlane, so he moved it over to the cars. And it had seven different generations, although not all of them were very long-lived. For instance, this one, uh, which I believe is either the second or, you know, there goes my, there goes my research, second or third gen, doesn't really matter, I think second. Uh, you know, it, it only lasted for two years. This was the way they did it back then. They had to change crap fast to keep up with the styles of the time. And, uh, you know, the Fairlanes were pretty popular cars. Uh, they'd be in two doors, four doors. They had a retractable hard top convertible. They had soft top convertibles. They had station wagons. Uh, you know, it was a fairly well-used platform for Ford. And, uh, yeah, it was anyway. Look, back to the point. So, look, Let's get into the moonshining aspect, which means we're going to get into bootlegging, uh, which kind of gets us on to NASCAR. Uh, this thing wouldn't have been used in NASCAR, at least if it was, I would, you know, didn't find any. Uh, the Galaxy Starliner of the same year had basically the same body as this, but kind of a sloping fastback roof. And uh, those seem to be the ones that the NASCAR guys liked for the super speedway stuff. So uh, this one would have been much more preferred by, you know, fleet companies, taxi cabs, police, that sort of thing. If they didn't buy it, then little old ladies would buy it. You know, grandmothers making their way to the grocery store uh, or very budget conscious accountants, you know, really, really tedious guys uh, who pinched every penny. They might end up in a uh, Fairlane 500 <laughs> holiday club coupe like this one. So um, that makes it the perfect car for bootlegging. Uh, moonshiners make illegal whiskey, bootleggers transport it, and uh, this car, it would have been invisible in the 19, I mean, basically, well, I mean, look, it's a good looking car, and now when you see it on the roads, obviously it's very special. Transport yourself back then, 1963, 4, 5, and it just looks like every other car on the road. And it's going to be basically invisible to the police, to other drivers, uh, which is the entire point. Uh, you know, bootlegging cars were not exactly advertised to be what they were. Uh, they needed to blend in. In fact, a lot of them were just black to blend into the night as well. Uh, but the whole point of them, like street sleepers, was to disguise, uh, you know, the performance parts that had been installed and the monsters under the hood, which this one certainly has. But we'll get into that. Uh, but for a moment, let's get back into the history of moonshining and bootlegging. Um, you know, like many people my age who didn't grow up in North Carolina, I was introduced to moonshining by Uncle Jesse. You know, never heard of it before that, but there you had this kindly Uncle Jesse. And then it turned out the guy's making whiskey and running it and hiding it from the revenue guy. So he was a criminal, uh, but he was still very lovable. The General Lee, I guess, was meant to be something between a bootlegging car and a stock car, which of course fits the historical mold. And uh, that's, um, you know, that's where it all goes. But frankly, it's a much deeper and richer history than that. And you have to go pretty far back. Uh, one could argue that American moonshining started in 1791 uh, in western Pennsylvania when the newly minted U.S. government decided to impose a whiskey tax uh, to pay for war debt. Uh, farmers up there were in the habit, you know, they had excess grain, whatever, they made a bunch of crap, they sold it, grew a bunch of crap, I should say, and then they had some left over. So they thought, all right, well, look, the way we're going to preserve that is by turning it into alcohol, which they did. And they were very proud of that. You know, they made good alcohol. It was even used as currency in some places. Uh, so the federal government sees this going on and thinks, man, okay, you know, we're going to tax the shit out of this. So they did. And the farmers went ballistic. Uh, you know, most of them had fought in the Revolutionary War. They were fighting against, you know, shitty principles like taxation without representation. And uh, all of a sudden, here's the 
their federal government deciding, hey, you know, we're in D.C., but we're going to tax you up there for your whiskey. So they went ape shit. They started violently protesting. They tarred and feathered revenue agents. That pissed off George Washington, who was president at the time. So he assembled a bunch of troops, led him themselves. He got on his own horse rode up to Pennsylvania with a bunch of troops behind him to put down this uh, thing called the Whiskey Rebellion. By the time he got there, everyone had already gotten kind of tired and gone home, so he really didn't have anything to do. Uh, but it was considered kind of a test of the U.S. government, and apparently they acquitted themselves well. I mean, instead of just going up and slaughtering everybody, uh, they managed it correctly. And of course, that's George Washington with his famous temperance and what have you. And, uh, you know, we look back in that now and say, okay, yeah, they did well. But, you know, that said, the farmers didn't pay shit. Even after Washington went up there, they they still weren't paying anything. And uh, a few years later, they just repealed the whole tax to save face for everybody. And uh, nobody got tarred and feathered anymore. So, um, But that said, the true history of moonshine as we know it, or at least the era that we know it, uh, got to start with the uh, implementation of Prohibition in 1919. That was kind of this Puritan pipe dream where, you know, rural farming religious people decided they didn't want to have alcohol infecting our society. And even if they were probably right in, you know, whatever small way, you can't do that. You can't just take away alcohol because me and people like me depend on it to get through the day. And uh, all that did was create this giant black market for alcohol uh, that was immediately taken over by criminal enterprise. I think famously what Joe Kennedy made his fortune in Prohibition and, you know, a bunch of other guys did as well who are legit now but their roots were in that because uh, people wanted alcohol this set up this giant black market and uh, you know people decided to provide and what that did was start up a whole industry of guys setting and hey, look you get into the south in the depression era these guys had no money at all they needed to do what they could to survive so they set up these stills on the mountainside uh, to make hooch or white lightning or mountain dew as in fact mountain dew the drink is related to moonshine uh, if i remember i'll get into that later but um, so they did that. But they're the moonshiners. They're the guys making it. You still had to transport it. And that's where the bootleggers came in. Uh, the name bootlegging came from guys who were delivering whiskey in their boot tops. You know, they put flasks in there. But of course, then the car came out. So bootlegging just started applying to everything, any way to transport whiskey. So you had all these guys in cars transporting whiskey, the revenue agents going after them. They decided to soup up the cars to try and get away. The Ford V8, uh, you know, was the advent of that in a way. It helped, um, yeah, it was the first sort of customizable engine that gave them real horsepower. Uh, and it, it, that became a thing. And all the bootleggers became pretty proud of their cars. They decided to start racing them against one another. And uh, that ultimately led to the formation of NASCAR, all these guys who were running around racing each other and, you know, showing off their hot rod bootlegging cars uh, started to race, you know, in a way that people wanted to watch. So a guy named Bill France decided to make a racing circuit out of it, actually took seed money from a famous moonshining family at the time to start it. And uh, thus NASCAR was born. Uh, in fact, Junior Johnson, one of the biggest names in NASCAR, uh, uh, his whole family was into moonshining and bootlegging, and that's where he got the money to start everything. And even just recently, he started a legal moonshine distillery to keep the family tradition going. You know, this is something NASCAR wants to put the kibosh on. They're not proud of it, but I think they should embrace it. You know, I think it's a really cool history when your sport is based on the alcohol and violence and fast cars and crashing and death and all that stuff. Uh, if you ever watch Thunder Road, kind of a cult movie with Robert Mitchum, then you know what I'm talking about. So uh, anyway, look, there it is. There's the briefest history of uh, moonshining and bootlegging in the United States, how NASCAR got its start. And uh, I'm going to pause it there. We're going to take a break, come back, and uh, keep going on this specific car. So uh, bear with me one moment. All right, so let's have a quick look at this particular car. The way the hood pops. You always have to adjust these old hinges, I find out. 
Uh, anyway, 1961. So, 60 and 61 was uh, this generation of Fairlane. Gone was the sort of radical curvature and ornateness of the 50s. They were trying to be a little bit more space age with this design and they pulled it off so it's smoother. Uh, you see the quad headlamps up front, the bumpers that are quite understated. Uh, you know they did have some sort of fancy hood treatment by 61 you just had the four Ford letters at the front, and it was all very simple and understated. Uh, it's almost slab-sided, very straight sides. Uh, the 60 had a longer tail fin that was straight up. Uh, this one got a shorter tail fin that was angled and meant to be, again, a little bit more space age and optimistic. You know, cars today are so friggin' pessimistic. I mean, they just nag you and depress you and tell you, you know, I, mean, I, I keep waiting for cars to, you know, say, hey, you're pathetic, you're killing the earth, you know, drive your bicycle, shut me off. That was not the case with cars like this. This was a forward-thinking, optimistic people who created this car, and they wanted to look like they were flying jets through the air, and they, you know, felt good about the future, and frankly, I think that's why these cars are from a better era than the stuff we have now, and uh, you can see it. But anyway, uh, being the club uh, coupe, it has sort of a formal roof line. Fascinating rear windshield. Uh, the, the rear windshield to me looks more like a, you know, space age front windshield. <laughs> the front windshield is not nearly as radical as that. Uh, but I think it looks great. And I think the tail fins look great. Uh, very, very cool. And you get into these sort of big round tail lamps, which are meant to sort of be jet exhausts. Again, sort of an understated bumper. Uh, you got the gas door there in the middle. Got a nice judicious use of chrome. You got a chrome impact strip down the side. You've got a, you know, chrome cap on the tail fin. You won't see any on the rocker panels. You won't see a lot of other trim because, again, this was their entry level full sized car. Uh, these things were used mostly for fleet service when it wasn't being run by you know, an old, uh, you know, lady going to church on Sunday. Now let's have a look at this one. First of all, the ride height, you can tell, has been altered. It's got a very, very nice stance. It's sitting kind of low. Then you start looking into the details a little bit. All of a sudden you realize that those back wheels have been widened. Those are, and this is real street sleeper style. So you've got factory steely rims, which, were much more likely as deep as the ones up front uh, that have now been added to to become much deeper so they could hold a bigger uh, rear tire which would give you more traction. Fascinating. So that's been done. That looks good. And on the outside, truly, that's about the only obvious modification you can see. Uh, let's have a look inside the trunk, if I can find the damn keys, that is. There you see the uh, Fairlane 500 badging over the Ford gas thing. You got this little flip-up keyhole cover, which is all hard to operate one-handed, but I'm going to give it a shot here. And now we get into the theme of this car. Uh, you can see it's got a crate of what's, you know, supposed to represent a load of moonshine. And of course, that's exactly how it would have been done. Now, you know, the moonshiner cars, they tended to hide pan. They made them... You know, like they might hollow out the back seat or create false floors or do other things to hide their moonshine. I suppose the guys who were really egotistical just threw the shit in the trunk and uh, figured they could outrun anyone who tried to stop them. I remember watching that Robert Mitchum Thunder Road movie where the uh, revenue collector cars actually had big alligator style front clamps that would come on and clamp the bumper of the car they were chasing. Seems absolutely fascinating. Uh, but the one key to moonshine running is not really what's in the trunk, but what's under the hood. And that's where this car starts to get really fascinating. Now, a dead giveaway, especially if you're on the street, is this Holman Moody front license plate. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm not going to attest to it because this car came without any information. I guess the guy who had it died, and uh, we weren't able to get the story on it. But here you've got this Holman Moody front license plate, and under the hood, in traditional moonshining style is a 428 Cobra Jet 
uh, engine, which is a fantastic big block FE engine from Ford. It, you know, you're talking late 60s. The engine was developed uh, to compete with GM and uh, Chrysler, which were kicking Ford's ass in the horsepower wars at the time. And the 427 that Ford developed uh, for racing at Le Mans, you know, it had solid lifters. It was a big high revving, frightening engine. It just wasn't subdued enough to put in the passenger cars. So one of the dealers that, you know, performance dealer that was very close to Ford, uh, pushed and pushed and pushed to get an engine made for the uh, cars that would take it to GM and Chrysler. And the 428 Cobra Jet was the result. Uh, then they became the Super Cobra Jet. Uh, it is enormous, seven liters, uh, factory rated at 335 horse with 440 pounds of torque, uh, foot pounds, uh, an absolute monster, and it did the job. It, uh, you know, propelled the Mustangs and Torinos and Cougars and, you know, kept them up with the competition, and uh, it has become one of the more fabled drag racing engines of the era, although they're made in, they're not that easy to find, and that's what makes this so interesting. Now, if this is a true Holman Moody built 428, that's pretty friggin' special. Uh, that company was basically Ford's racing wing, you know, this quasi factory setup that was run with full support from Ford Motor Company to handle all of their racing. They built a lot of NASCAR engines, they built a lot of NASCAR chassis and, you know, frames and parts. Uh, more famously, they built uh, some of the GT40s that raced at Le Mans and Sebring, and uh, they continue to build GT40s. But anyway, that, fa you know, Ford versus Ferrari, a lot of you guys have seen that movie. The number three car that finished there was built by Holman Moody. They also ended up with all of the original plans, blueprints, designs for the GT40. They continue to build them even today. Uh, you can go buy basically a new GT40 from Holman Moody. And uh, because it's all based on all the original plans, it qualifies as an original GT40, not a reproduction. And you can run the thing in vintage classes and vintage racing. And in almost every way, uh, it is exactly as the original GT40s came. So Holman Moody is a monster of a company. They were in the Racing Hall of Fame. Uh, you know, a lot of the guys who are still working there today are, you know, guys who were there originally. They must be a hundred years old. Uh, but it's uh, but it's a fascinating bit of uh, American racing history. And in fact, I considered doing the whole video just on Holman Moody. But anyway, there it is. So in true moonshining, bootlegging style, you've got this nondescript car, you've got this, you know, grocery getter thing, you've got secretly widened rear tires, and under the hood, you have a 428 Cobra Jet with twin Edelbrock four barrels, a Ford top loader four-speed transmission. Uh, whoever made those uh, exhaust headers, was an artist beyond description. You can see him running there into the firewall. Very, very cool stuff. Uh, you know, air conditioning, which of course would not have been a thing on a moonshining car, but is a thing today. Nice to see a vintage air kit in there. Uh, but uh, an incredible, incredible engine uh, from, uh, you know, the firewall forward. This car is very, very special. So neat stuff and very, very fun to drive. And of course you look inside and what do you got? Bench seat, skinny steering wheel. You know, the tack maybe is a little bit of a giveaway, but you know, any a 289 two barrel could have that tack put on by some guy. And uh, you just wouldn't know. Uh, back seats, you know, your Canadians, they're gonna be fairly chipper back there. Yeah, it's wide, this car is really wide. Uh, you can fit three of them, even fat guys back there, no problem. Got a nice big package shelf, little place to hang your dry cleaning. Uh, they did make a business coupe, I think, at the, where the back seat was just a package shelf for like, you know, your display vacuum cleaners as you went door to door, but those are kind of rare. Uh, but anyway, look, I'm gonna pause it for two minutes, get my crap in the trunk, get my crap together, then we're gonna hop in, fire it up, and go for a drive. So bear with me one moment. All right, so let's have a look inside this thing.
go for a spin. First of all, I love the color, the sort of aqua blue green, you know, Miami South Beach look. Uh, absolutely fantastic in this car. And again, I don't think it's exactly what the Moonshiners would have had. I think they preferred a more subtle color, but uh, yeah, I'm happy they have it on this one. And again, entry level cars, you've got this sort of painted steel dash, which looks great. You've got a big horizontal uh, instrument cluster with 120 mile an hour speedo, which again is probably fairly accurate. You think of those old 50s movies, you know, where the needle was hovering around night, you know, the guys that had the Alfred Hitchcocky thing going, oh my god, we're gonna crash. It has that look of one of those speedos. Uh, Sun Super Tack, kind of a famous old, you know, hot rodder thing strapped to the uh, steering column. Giant steering wheel with super thin grip, of course, inherent to cars that have no power steering. Uh, you got your key uh, ignition over here in the left Porsche Le Mans style, although I'm sure not in the same idea. Uh, love the radio delete plate. I think that fits. Here's your climate control here. You've got your right air, your wipers, and your lighter. Over here you've got your brake release, your lights, which the brake release to me I've pulled it nine times trying to turn on the headlights, uh, lights, left air, uh, turn signal, horn, which probably doesn't work at all. In fact, let's see, maybe with the key on, wrong key. There we go. No, no horn at all. Isn't that typical? Uh, over here, you got a Fairlane 500 script on the glove box, a little place to store more whiskey or narcotics or some kind of 38 special. Uh, lovely little, you know, frameless, almost center view mirror that bolts up here, doesn't go to the glass. That's nice. Uh, down here, you've got your vintage air, which works great in this car. Really, really nice. Very dialed in. Uh, you got an ashtray because, of course, people smoked. And uh, a lovely curvature on the uh, stick of this uh, Ford top loader four speed. So, all right, let's do it. Let's go for a spin. I'm going to open up this. I'm going to leave the vent window closed. And uh, we'll see what we got. Let's see if it fires up. It's a little bit. Oh, yeah, it fires right up. A little bit cold natured. With dual quads and seven liters, the fuel mileage is not good. Just leave it at that. Has a very healthy cam lobe. But that said, and people are gonna laugh at me, I think this car is a little bit quiet. I think they used like Cadillac mufflers on it. Uh, honestly, you know, from the sound of it, it could be a 289 two barrel. It's just not really that loud. And I think that again is going back to the street sleeper thing. If you're in the car next to it, they're probably, well, they might hear it. They got their windows up and the radio on. They may not hear you, and I think that's the point. Got it just like revving it. Peter's gate got a lot faster. Somebody did some engineering. And Dalton's windshield, by the way, was absolute shit. And like I said, the thing. There it goes. It falls on its face around 3,500. I think it needs an ignition box upgrade. But we'll still get the point across. And I mean, what a nicely sorted car. I could tell they had rebuilt the front end of it. You know, the rear end is just a solid axle, live axle on leaf spring, so there's not much they can do there other than uh, maybe a bushing or something, but the front end has definitely been sorted in. And this thing would make a terrific daily driver. It's one of the best old cars that I've driven to and from work, which I'm generally not a fan of because they always strand me. Uh, but even with dual quads and everything else, this thing seems pretty well sorted in. goes a little over 3,000 ignition just cuts out god I wonder if there's not something a guy did just to stop abusers like me from torturing his car well, we got some traffic but let's do it and I gotta say you know as far as a classic car goes this one is pretty nice to drive even without the power steering 
I think a big part of that might be because it has pretty good air conditioning. Oh, wait, now we got school bus issues going on right in front of me. God, I should have hauled ass to get around that one. All right, I'm going to pause it for a minute. I'll pick up when we take off again. Who knows how long this will take. All right, we should be good to go here in a minute. Can't get over three. Oh, what a shame. Let me try going up on half throttle. Oh, Lord, now I'm going to run over children. Oh, God, if there's two things in the world I hate, it's charities and children. Let me pause it for a minute. Somebody's going to have to tune this thing in. Well, anyway, you got the point. So as, you know, labored as all of that was, uh, if you drive normal for the moment, it's a really fun driver. To get it over 3,000 RPM, I guess we're going to need a little bit of an MSD box or figure out what the hell is going on. I'm gonna guess it's got, you know, 390s, 410s, something like that. It really, uh, you know, doesn't want to cruise at highway speeds. We're showing 50. I think we might be going a little faster than that. But um, it's definitely geared low for the street. And there it is. So 1961 Ford Fairlane. Uh, 500, 428 Cobra Jet, top motor, four speed. Obviously needs a little tuning. Penelope's gonna get, have to get her shit together. <coughs> but overall, I'm a pretty incredible car and a very fun jaunt down into the history of moonshining. Whether it was fair or not to do it on this car, it was fun to do. So thank you very much for having a look. Really, really appreciate it. I'm going to try and get some more coming soon. Hopefully I can get some of those cars together that are fighting me every step of the way. And uh, we'll have a bit of fun. I'll try to get back into the video swing. Yeah, good stuff. Take care and we'll see you with the next one.